Today, we welcome Trevor Chapman to the REI Foundation. Hey, Trevor. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for today. Awesome. awesome. Thank you for being here. Well, a little Absolutely. more on Trevor here. He's got quite the bio. Uh, Trevor Chapman is one of the world's leading digital strategists that builds enterprise value online. Trevor, Trevor has been got, profiled on CNBC, Entrepreneur, The Hunt, Huffington Post, Yahoo, and Money.com, Inc. Wow, just a lot. Complex, hustle, many more. Wow, Trevor. He's thrown traditional <laughs> online marketing on his head with the largest disruption since pay-per-click was introduced. Merging door-to-door -door brick and mortar strategy with the internet uh, has brought results unheard of, including an eight-figure offer from Clark Capital in less than a year in business. I got to jump wow. into that. He's now sought to consult for brands who see him as one of the top digital strategists in America. He owns over a dozen of his own e-commerce sites and Trevor started the Academy of Arbitrage, which I actually just was on the site before. It's quite amazing. Over 400 people have entered e-commerce in the last six months under his instruction and many have made over a million in that time. Wow. Even uh, more have many uh, made hundreds of thousands of dollars with zero prior experience building off of Trevor's marketing method and the vast majority of earn more than the average yearly salary in America and replace their jobs. Well, that's what a lot of us are here for real estate. So we Whoa. look forward to getting that feedback. And he's also founded ecomcon.com, the largest virtual summit in history. Ecomcon is a free event for individuals interested in internet marketing. And it's also the largest event in the industry, which has ever occurred. Boom. There you go. <laughs> that's that's literally the first time so i didn't write that that's the first time i heard it and i'm just like whoa that actually does sound awesome good, good. <laughs> like, i did that yeah I, it's like who's that yeah, exactly. yeah who is I that do have your, on this other piece of paper i have actually your beginnings so i want you to let our listeners know how do you go from catching 36 salmon every day gutting them smoking them canning them then riding them to the harbor docks to play your saxophone and sell sand dollars to tourists. How do you go from that to all of that? Yeah, so it's a pretty long and lengthy overnight success story, right? Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up in Guam. My dad was a scuba diving instructor. I loved it. I spent every day on the boat with him. All I wanted to do when I grew up was be my dad's deckhand. Um, that was the sum of my aspirations. Uh, when I was 12, we moved to Alaska, Sitka, Alaska. And, uh, you know, my, my parents taught me a lot of excellent things, pursue my passions, um, accrue experiences over things. Uh, and, and then there was a lot of the hard lessons that I learned as well, which in retrospect, I'm grateful for. For instance, you know, going to school with my uh, new school clothes were always the school clothes of my buddies from the prior year. And so I, I did pretty good of when I was running to never lift my soul up too high so they couldn't see their name written on the bottom of it. And eventually I realized that, you know what, it is what it is. I can either spend the rest of, you know, my high school career hiding the fact that, oh dude, you had that shirt last year, that's crazy. I got the same one, I can, I can go through that or I can just own the, the fact that this is what it is. And, uh, and I think, you know, I attribute my ability to just say, you know, I'm more than what, what shoes I wear, I'm more than, uh, you know, what car I drive, the family van, um, because of the experiences that I had younger traveling around um, the world because of my dad's uh, diving career. And so I just learned to embrace the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're a poor family. It wasn't until years later that I realized that not only were we poor, we were like a subsistence family. That story about the salmon, uh, probably five years ago or so, I don't know when it was, we were at my wife's family for uh, some holiday and her sisters had planned something where Q and a, not a Q and a, but some family thing. And everyone was sharing their least favorite chores growing up. And they were like mowing the lawn, doing the dishes, all the stuff. And I was blown away. I was like, man, my, I would have given anything to have my worst chore growing up to <laughs> do the dishes. My least favorite chore growing up was waking up before the sun because I had to beat fish and game to the shore so they would not catch me <laughs> catching 36 salmon, my family's entire limit each day, uh, riding home on my bike with them in an expedition backpack, uh, gutting them, smoking them, canning the previous ones from the previous day, and then getting down to the docks where the tourists would line up to jump back on the cruise ship. And then I would play my saxophone with them, look them in the eye as they'd walk by, you know, and guilt them into tossing some money into the the, the little thing. And I got good at playing my saxophone, 
but it, all of those experiences, it turned into just, it, this is what it was. It wasn't, it, I, I didn't have the option. And, and it taught me that, uh, you know, hard work is not something that's optional for, for me growing up. You know, if I didn't play my saxophone, we couldn't afford to pay the mortgage. And so I was the oldest of five kids. It just was a given. This is what happens during the summer. My buddies drive around in their trucks and everything. And I play my sax on the docks. And it was just, I got beyond the point where it was like, oh, can, can we work something else out? Because it was just an innate truth. This happened. And I, you know, I think a lot of the problems that a lot of people have with actually doing the work is that the decision has not been made. It's still an option. They think, oh, I could get up today and I could do this. Or I can browse Facebook for a little while. There's always tomorrow. And because the decision hasn't been made, there's a great guy, I forget his name. I forget everything about him except that he said, uh, to decide has the same suffix as suicide, homicide, and other sides. You know, side, that suffix is the end of other things. So the end of life or with B side, it's the end of other options. Once you decide, it's no longer a question, am I going to do this? You, know, you can talk to guys that go to the gym and, and women that go to the gym. They don't suffer, you know, the situation that most of us who aren't in the habit of going to the gym is, should I go today? Should I not go today? I can always go to tomorrow because it's just the decision's already been made. And so growing up with the decision already made, I was able just to accrue the habit of hard work and getting stuff done. Um, and that kind of carried through. That doesn't mean that from time to time, you know, I don't struggle with the thought of I could be spending my time doing this or that. That happens. But, um, but I, I went from doing that to college, uh, fell in love in college is after I lived overseas for a few years and uh, realized that I had to make it rain. Um, you know, and so, uh, my, I had a buddy. What was that deciding factor that made you make the decision that you had to really just bring it in? That I had a wife. That's yeah. what it was. I'm 21 years, I'm 22 years old. I have a wife. She's 20 and we got pregnant and, uh, and I'm like, okay. Like, uh, you know, this is for real, as, as for real as I could fathom, you know, as a 22 year old boy. And, well, it's crazy because uh, then again, again, the decision, you had to decide right then and then that you were going to take your life to where it needed to be. Everything you've said is so amazing and keep on going. Sorry, I interrupted. No problem. Not at all. <laughs> keep interrupting. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so I had a buddy, he said, hey, I sold pest control in California last summer during college, come out and sell, and you can make, you know, everything that you need to get through. You can basically graduate debt free. And uh, so I said, okay, I went out there, and uh, I killed it that first year, and it was only, it wasn't because I had some talent that these guys, these guys had been knocking for three or four years. They were way better than me. If they worked five hours, I worked 10 hours. If they worked six, I worked 12. That was, that was all that was to it. And, uh, you know, and I was determined to be at number one. Why? I don't know. It was just something inside of me that if I'm going to spend my time doing something, then I need to be the best at it. Why? And it wasn't even a, a thing that I'm better than him. It's, it was an internal concept that, hey, if there is a level of achievement, if I'm spending my time doing this, why would I achieve less than the most that I can achieve? Like it was, it was a logical game for me. And, uh, one thing led to another. I was a really poor student. I got great grades, but I was a poor student. I didn't do well in a situation. You know, I was a broadcast journalism major, and I'd walk in, and uh, I thought, how is me memorizing how many properties Ted Turner bought before <laughs> CNN have any bearing on my degree, uh, you know, on, on anything? I just, I couldn't comprehend this. And my view was, I'm paying you. You work for me, professor. I'm paying you to educate me on stuff that I don't know. And that view clashed heavily with the university. They did not like that view. <laughs> and so, but that, that was how I saw it. And uh, after starting a handful of businesses, uh, my last semester in school, I, I eventually became a philosophy major. It was the only subject that when I studied, I felt like I actually improved as a human. Um, my last semester, like many college students, I had a silent protest. And that was that I was not going to graduate, that I was going to be more successful than my professors without a degree, you know, because they consistently told me, dude, you, you know, you got to get a degree, go work for somebody, all this stuff. And uh, in retrospect, maybe that wasn't the best. It's, I, I don't know. It, like I'm, I'm neutral on the subject. And uh, so I dropped out and this is after I had a company going for a few years and it was right. It was the, uh, the beginning of 2008. And I was expecting uh -huh. to have the best summer of our lives. I mean, we had 40 sales reps, three branches, 
California, Arizona, Florida. We killed it the summer previous. I mean, this was, you know, I just come off the best summer of my life where, you know, I had a team of a hundred guys and, uh, and the team that I directly oversaw produced, uh, you know, $4 million in brand new contracts. The team overall just killed it. And so this was the year, this was my breakout year and, uh, everything went wrong that year. Like absolutely everything went wrong. And I could not comprehend because to me, people were saying the economy is being affected and all this stuff. But it, again, it didn't register. It was kind of that distortion field where uh, whatever's happening outside is outside of my immediate space. And in, in retrospect, I see that, yeah, the economy played a role in it. But to me, I couldn't understand that. And so it was, uh, it was a very fascinating time uh, for me individually regarding just personal growth because nothing I did worked. Uh, lost 40,000 customers, you know, went to like, you know, basically like having nothing, like anything that we had that we could sell, we sold so that we could pay the bills. I made sure I paid all my guys, whatever they were owed. And then uh, it, it basically came to a head in a period of a couple of days where uh, my wife's birthday came up, you know, and we'd been married, I don't know how many, three years or something at this point. And each year I had taken her on some trip and each year it got bigger and bigger. And this year I was like, man, I got like 20 bucks. Literally, that's all I have. And, uh, so I bought her, uh, chinchilla and at the pet store, they're like, what cage do you want? And I was like, man, I want a cardboard box because I don't have any money for a cage <laughs> and going home with the chinchilla in a cardboard box, giving that to her that night I laid on the bed and I, my plan literally, cause I had to make a plan and it was, okay, I'm going to go get two shifts at Walmart because that's what I can do. That, that's what, that's, that's the, my ability, it, you know, that it had affected me to that degree that I, that was my plan. So and, let's touch a little bit on that because you, you rode this roller coaster throughout your entire life growing up where, where you, were, you were just almost accepted you know, what you had. And then you make this huge roller coaster transition where you ride way up this wave and then you, and you come back down now and you're set on going back to Walmart. How did you first find the way to really just make that escalate in that huge transition? You were driven, but driven to work for somebody and driven to take on to your own business is a whole nother capacity. What was that one step that you said, I'm just going to do this for myself? Well, I only worked for someone that first summer. When I went out there that first summer and worked for somebody else, I said, okay, I made this amount of money. That means they probably made 10, 20 times this. And as I started to dig into the numbers, I was like, wow, they did. You know, they, they paid what I made as a fraction of the value of the customer base that I brought. So after that first summer, that I, I incorporated and it was my own company from there moving on. Um, what kind I of have, company? It, it started as a marketing company and then it turned into a pest control company. So we marketed for other pest control companies and then we brought it all under the roof as I understood the industry better. Um, so a door to door service based company with RMR so that I knew what, what money was going to be coming in month in, month out, you know, no hit and quit one and done type of sales. Um, and so I, I don't, it's hard for me to, you know, establish what transpired internally. Um, it, you know, early on, I think a lot of it was just a desire to, uh, avoid pain and I experienced more pain by having a boss than I did from, you know, the stresses of just being my own boss. And that first summer, I, I, I mean, I was an independent contractor, so I, you know, technically I didn't have a boss, but it still wasn't my company. It still wasn't my, my customer base, et cetera. Does that answer? Yeah, hundred percent. So it's a Tony Robbins, either uh, going away from pain or going towards pleasure kind of mentality on that. And so you, you go down this roller coaster, 2008, you're at this point, you're ready to, to go to Walmart. Why? Why do you say, why do you stop and where do you go from there? So Walmart was like my, you know, I had just, everything I tried failed. And I had never experienced this before in my life. Prior, anything I did succeeded. I mean, it wasn't hard, you know. I, whether it was academically, I didn't have to try to get great grades. Uh, athletically, I didn't have to try to, you know, be in the top tier. Nothing, there was no real, it didn't require a lot of effort. And that was bad for me. That was bad. That, that was something that set me back many years, believing that I only had to put forth a fraction of the effort to achieve optimal results. And so um, I, I try to help my kids avoid that situation. I think that oftentimes, you know, based on the school system and uh, just 
public programs, there's such a discrepancy in um, where they set the bar. And so if you've got someone that works just slightly harder, they, they extremely exceed the bar. And that creates a mentality of, I can, I can literally put forth a fraction of the effort and be at the top of whatever it is, my class or my team, whatever the case may be. And you know, especially in Alaska, there was not a lot of competition. <laughs> and so, um, so the Walmart thing came about because everything I did failed. And it was like, man, if I go out and I, and I knock doors today, I'm not going to get sales. Like for so, I've lost my mojo. It was, it was, uh, I mean, it was a last resort. I didn't, I didn't go work for Walmart, but that was, that was my plan. And what happened was I sat there and, um, you know, I, I would go out and have these moments of meditative, um, release. I, I don't even know how to describe it, but you know, I would go out in Florida. We lived near Clearwater. I would go out to the beach. I would sit there and over, I had this idea just kind of ruminating in the back of my head. And it was, look, the things aren't working right now. So in, what am I good at? I can recruit guys and share a vision. So while my plan was to go to Walmart, this was, this was roaming through the back of my head. And I thought, how can I recruit college guys and do this? Well, I'm going to, and, and the plan just kind of created itself. I'm going to get, you know, Greyhound buses from the 1970s because they're retro and they look cool. I'm going to put shag carpets and ceilings all over them. I'm going to throw TVs in there. I'm going, I'm going to create basically this viral thing or this, I guess viral isn't the word. I'm going to create a physical space where when I drive by a college campus, the guys will be like, wow, I want to be a part of that. I'll bring them inside and then I'll get them to sign up to sell during the summer. And then I'll sell these sales reps to companies that need to create sales because everyone's losing customers. Um, called up a buddy. I pitched him on the idea. You know, I told him buy in for 10 grand, uh, which he did. So I went from preparing to go to Walmart to having 10 grand, you know, sent to my account. Um, and, uh, we went from there out to California, bought a bus. I relentlessly pursued love sack until eventually they said, give this guy whatever he wants because he will not stop calling the CEO. <laughs> so, That's great. I love the maniacal laugh. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I got, I don't know, $50,000. In fact, here's one of the, uh, sectional couches. I still have this from back then. It's a good reminder to me. This is like a $20,000 setup right here that they just gave me because I was like, you guys need to sponsor this bus. It's going to get you all this stuff and everything. You know, eventually we had two buses. This is before really YouTube. This is before annotations online. I had a guy that created software where we would recruit these guys, you know, in these buses because they were like these surf buses with these massive wraps. Um, like I said, shag ceilings, TVs with halo tournaments and everything like that. We'd pull up and college guys wanted to just hang out in there. And then they'd be like, dude, what, what do you guys do? I'd pitch them on selling during the summer how much money they could make. The second bus would pull up, and it was a training bus. You know, we had 15 different uh, sections for them to sit down. Um, and basically, we, we, I developed this software with my partner at the time. Um, we isolated there are only 13 objections if you're selling pest control. There's no more than 13. So if you can master these 13, then if the customer can be sold, they will be sold. And... Um, it was called train my reps. And so we created this entire training program that ended in a, like a final test, which was like a choose your own adventure um, portal, basically, where they would see a guy knock a door, customer would answer. And then based on what the customer said, the video would pause and they had a series of responses and it would time their response. They could choose a response and they could start to get the sale, start to lose the sale. Almost. It was dynamic in nature. And because I could go to these companies and say, here are the sales reps. Now, unlike everyone else who's recruiting, who just says, Hey, we're going to have 30 bodies show up. You have a peg leg and an eye patch. You're in man. Like, like that's, <laughs> that's what it was. I said, you've got data now on these reps and you know where their strong points are, where their weak points are, what they need to work on. Can they not close? Can they not describe the service? And, uh, we went and that next summer I got the largest pest control company on the planet who, um, you know, hadn't been using door to door for like a decade to sign. Um, you know, we made like half a million dollars that year. It was big. And that, that was kind of like my comeback. 
Um, where and we I love guess- that because ideally, even for our show, you know, we, we focus a lot on real estate, but a lot of us, uh, you know, we're meeting with sellers. We're constantly out there meeting with sellers and, and the rejection is part of the process, but how to, how to know how you can help that rejection. Cause the rejection may not be, no, they don't want to sell or they, they don't like you or, or they don't like the prices. Maybe they don't understand the process. And so that's why we thought it was really, really important to speak to you, Trevor, just for that one part right there is just noticing the rejection and how can you help the situation. So go pivoting, ahead. Pivoting is critical. Correct. Yeah, like you have to pivot. So here's, let me fast forward because I think this will be really applicable to your audience. So fast forward many years, um, I got into security, commercial security, um, sold a couple companies, brought the Iron Dome over from Israel into the United States and eventually landed in solar because uh, um, I realized that I needed to not stray from my core comp- competency. My core competency was um, going out there and uh, having, here, I mean, it takes a unique person to knock on someone's door, get them to open it, have them invite you in instead of slamming it during dinner, and then two hours later walking out with a solar system contract for 100 grand for 20 years. 20, I mean, that's practically a mortgage. And, um, and that type of sale, so, so I, I, that's the front end of the system. The back end is this. Our competition was Solar City, you know, that Elon Musk now owns, and he was an investor prior. Solar City spent $3 billion, and they made $1.5 billion. And they're the most valuable solar company, you know, residential solar company on the planet. Now, small business, we can't do that. If we spend a dollar and make 50 cents back, that's called going bankrupt. For every dollar we spend, we need to make five, ten, a hundred dollars back. Uh, we just simply don't have the luxury of burning cash. And so creating a small business in the same industry um, where all the other players were bank funded, all the other players have massive investments behind them, where they could wait 30 years to be profitable just wasn't an option. And so this is the part that's going to be pertinent to your audience. Um, this is uh, November, or so this is 2016, beginning of 2017. And uh, we're in five states, headquartered out of Utah, where I'm at right now. And uh, I'm walking through my marketing department, and they said, we need more money. And I have a problem with that because they spend money, they're not making any money. And it goes back to what I just talked about. Um, Every dollar we spend somehow needs to ultimately be bringing money back in. Through all departments, accounting, legal, doesn't matter. It needs to be revenue generating activities. And even if it takes a few generations or a few degrees from the actual activity, ultimately it needs to bring revenue, my philosophy. And uh, I'm like, well, tell me why you need more money and why you're not making money. And they say SEO, PPC, SEM, blah, blah, blah. And it dawns on me. You guys are engaging in query-based marketing. You're engaging in search-based marketing. You're waiting for somebody to want what we have. Now, if you wait for them to want what we have, we engage against Solar City. We engage in a race to the bottom. If, if we all want toothbrushes, we jump on Amazon, you type in toothbrush, I type in toothbrush. Displayed are the top 10. Likely, we will both choose the highest quality toothbrush at the lowest price. Now, for the toothbrush vendors, they're fighting over pennies now. And it's really hard to operate as a small business on a penny profit or, or just a micro profit. Whereas, if we go and someone, and I don't realize I want a toothbrush, and they proposition me a toothbrush, they now can sell that toothbrush to me at whatever perceived value they can effectively illustrate. I will be happy to buy the Hoover vacuum for $1,000 because instead of wanting one and doing my research online, some dude knocked on my door, showed me how awesome it was. I'm shocked and thrilled and can't believe there's so much dirt in my carpet. Bam, $1,000, happy to do it. But I do a little bit of research and I'm going to realize that, no, there's other options online. I can get the same quality for 100 bucks. I don't know how much. But so... So seeing what they wanted, seeing why they wanted the money, I said, there's got to be a way to go door to door online or screen to screen, how we go door to door in the real world. Watched YouTube videos for about a week, learned everything I could on e-commerce, set up a site, broke a million bucks in 90 days, 2 million 90 days later, and said, okay, I've been in door to door for 12 years, and my passion for this is really low. Um, And I'm now, after all these years, in a position where so, so I, I'm always careful when I talk about this because I think at the wrong time, it is incorrect advice. When 2008 <laughs> happened and, I'm, and everything's falling apart, I turned and I said to one of my guys, I said, hey, um, I'm just not passionate about pest control. That was a cop out for me to say, you know, that was a cop out. Of course, I wasn't passionate about pest control. But he, and this was me saying, hey, we need to engage in something else because 
yeah, I'm not even passionate about this. Why are we wasting our time doing this? And he said, I think you need to be passionate about making money right now. And it hit me as yes, you know, my obligation as an entrepreneur, as uh, a guy who has a family, um, as you know, my civic obligation, all of that requires revenue. These are my obligations. And so once I have extra jet fuel to burn, then I'll fly around and do whatever I want to do. But right now there is a need and that need needs to be met. After the need is met, then I can focus on desires. And so I'm worried to say this prior because I think too often people get caught in the, oh, I want to pursue my passion. I invested 25 bucks in Bitcoin. You know, my new title is entrepreneur, adventurer, all this <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and that highlight reel on Instagram of what entrepreneurship is, the second you decide you're an entrepreneur, you're in private jets, you know, beautiful women in champagne all around you. It's just a completely false notion. And so um, while being passionate about life is absolutely critical, you can go through life and not spend a single day on a laptop on a beach in Fiji and still be absolutely passionate about what you do. And you can do that in Fiji. Once you earn your money, now go pursue your passions. That's what I teach my kids because I got caught in the jumping from passion to passion thing for the first five years of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, and and you cannot succeed when you do that. And that's huge. And, and so let's fast forward to today and it, where you're at. We've seen you transform a lot. If someone walks up to you and says, Trevor, uh, tell me, what do you do? What do you say? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, a digital strategy, like entrepreneur online. Like it's all, it's all based online. And this is why. And I think for real estate investment, this is the direction that everybody should go. When I, when my door to door buddies say, dude, what, you know, what, what are you doing? I say to them, imagine if you recorded your perfect pitch ever. Like the, they can't say no to it. You cloned yourself a million times. And then you only knocked on the doors where people were home. You knew that they were qualified. You knew that they would likely buy. And you caught them in a moment where nothing else is distracting them. That's the power of being online. I can create the optimal ad and I can say, show it only to these people. And I can segment the audience so that I can find people that potentially, you know, are soon going to foreclose on their home, like, you know, potentially in, in uh, some of your audience's instances, what they look for. And then I can give them a message on the most intimate device of their lives in the most intimate location, you know, in their house in a moment where they can click on it. Now, it's not as easy as that because you're competing with their friend feed and, you know, YouTube videos, but that's the power of online marketing. It took a hundred million dollars five years prior when Target was doing this, segmenting audiences, sending out personalized messages to, you know, and they got all kinds of flack for it. You and I don't have a hundred million dollars to waste on developers creating this technology. It's been built. You can use it for free, except for the cost of your ads actually showing to people. There's not even a monthly charge to use it. Facebook gives you the ability to isolate audiences of buyers that are ready right now for no dollars whatsoever. And you're able to target them day in, day out. And instead of you, there may be some guys that you know, knock on people's doors and say, hey, I buy homes that are about to foreclose. You can only knock on one door at a time. The amount of doors you can reach in a day, at 5, 10, I don't know, based on how far you're driving, you can hit a million potential foreclosures in a single hour if you've got the ability. That's the power of online marketing. Now, second, and then I'm like, shut up. Um, <laughs> uh, the funny thing is I've had like 10 questions filter through my head okay, and then you answer them. No, you answer oh, them okay. like directly after. So I'm just like, I'm just gonna let them talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, no, awesome. No. So so let me let me backtrack. So for, for for our audience, what you're saying is that you know, a lot of us do direct mail marketing. We send out postcards, we go online, figure out where to send these postcards to, we send them out, and then we either go there or send our acquisitions managers there. They knock on the door, you know, I make an appointment, they knock on the door, and they have a chat, and maybe it turns into a contract. So what you're saying is, instead of doing that, you can actually, if you have the knowledge and you have the correct pitch, you can actually go online and hit like a million people at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like a thousand would yeah. be more than a lot of people are doing. And you can drive traffic that way. Yeah, I'm saying you record on video with your iPhone. Too many people find way too many reasons to not do it. Wait till I have the perfect lighting. Do it right now. I mean, I'm sitting on the ground right now 
You know, like this is not podcast appropriate stuff, but this is what we got to do. Perfect. You know, right now. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't wait till everything is perfect. You grab your iPhone and you take 10 tries to get the best pitch possible. You throw it on a landing page. There's software that makes this super easy. ClickFunnels um, is what I would recommend uh, for my buddy Russell. You throw it on a landing page. You say your pitch, you make sure that it is what you would say on the door. If you knocked on their door, hit their pain points, solve the solution for them, have them click a button to give you their email, you know, their phone number, all this stuff. There's a lot, you can get really fancy here, but start super basic. Collect these leads and then uh, potentially make them even qualify themselves. The best marketers are the ones that have an offer, pull back, and then these customers are like, no, I, I need to talk to you. I'll pay you hundred dollars to schedule an appointment with you right now. You know, if it doesn't work, you'll refund me. Like, like those are quality leads as opposed to knocking on the same door, you know, every day for 10 days straight because they're, this is the one I, this is the one I know. honey, I knocked on the door and I know they're going to be home tomorrow. This is the one yeah. <laughs> like that, that doesn't work. You know, that that's false hope. And, um, this is, this is a much smarter way to do it. So the work still has to be done. Um, you know, you're not, this isn't a shortcut to avoid the work. This is just a much better way to do it. And it allows you to duplicate your efforts, um, infinitely as many times as you want in whatever geographic region that you want. And then that data is highly valuable, highly valuable. The data that you're collecting on the customers, because you can use that for multiple things following that. I mean, you get, you know, you get a hundred people who have foreclosed you know, they're trying to figure out what to do next. You create, you take half hour and create a few videos about what people who have foreclosed in the past did to get back on their feet. You throw it on a little membership site, again, use ClickFunnels, and then you only target those hundred people on Facebook and by email. Need to get back on your feet? Just foreclose your home? Here's my five-step process that has worked for so, so, and so, and so. Yours for only 25 bucks a month or whatever. And now, and now you're taking those same people and you're creating alternate revenue streams. Some of them are successful. Like, like there's an infinite number of things that you can do to roll forward. You take that money, put it into more real estate, but it's the power of being online. And I want to- So just, let me ask you this, just yeah. not to get so far. So I've heard of the Quick Funnels platform. We haven't used the platform. Ideally, so we launch on there, we create a membership site, we put up great videos with great content, hopefully helping people with their needs. And then- Will that help us target through Facebook? Will they linking that to Facebook? Or tell us the step for us who don't know where yeah. we're at and maybe can barely turn the computer on. So let's, I'll just tell you what I would do if I, was in, if I was in your spot. I would start first with contribution-based marketing. I would simply, instead of immediately trying to buy their house, I would start with solving their pain point, which is they might have to sell soon. They don't know yet. They might have to sell. So I would create some sort of product Video based, super basic. It, I mean, in your kitchen does not matter um, because the content is what's important. Where you are telling them might be foreclosing soon, here are the five things that will help you avoid foreclosure. And if you do have to foreclose, the one way to do it to maximize your exit. And then you hit homeowners and you hit, you know, where their revenue is. So I, I, I don't know, maybe some people get after the, the million dollar foreclosures. Some go after the hundred thousand dollar foreclosures. You can segment all that out. You hit it in your audience. You do that. It's a free opt-in. You're giving away this information for absolutely free. They're not, you're not charging for this. Um, it's just your best information for free. Now that you have that relationship with them and you have this group of audience, this is cheap. You can get these leads for five, 10 cents each. I mean, how can you do that by knocking on their doors? Because especially if you knock on their door and your pitch is to buy their home, you know, I mean, they don't want to do that. They don't want to foreclose. So you're giving them ways to not foreclose, but if you have to, this is how you make your most money. And because you've now developed that, they already know your face, they know you, you're who they're going to think of, you know, not the sign with the caveman on the side of the road that says we buy ugly houses. <laughs> this is who they're going to think. And uh, you've given that, con you've contributed to them. So now you're an authority figure. Now you've got all them. You take that audience and you create a custom audience in Facebook. All this you can Google, you know, it's out there. Now, only to that group, you send your next pitch, which is, I'll take your house off your hands, and I'll give you access, once I take it off, to the 10 things that I have noticed, that I have observed, 
other people who have had foreclosed or if I foreclosed what I did when I foreclosed to get back on my feet. And so sell it. You're going to sell it to somebody. Sell it to me because I'm going to give you all this extra information to help you succeed after you foreclose. And they're going to go to you. And uh, they may shop around a little bit, but probably not. We shop around when we are not in, a, not in desperation mode. When, we're, when we are in desperation mode, we seek immediate pain relief. And the largest pain relief is getting rid of the house and knowing what to do next. And if you provide that pain relief, they will go to you. That's what I would do. And then you take it one step further and you create a lookalike audience. So Facebook will use a regression model and they'll say these people, these thousand people, you know, of these leads have these things in common. So who else has these things in common? They create that audience. You push that out there to that same, to that new audience that looks just like these people. And now you've got a whole new pool, 2.1 million people in all of America that look like these people. Now you can pull that down just this state or that state. Like you can really automate this to the point where, um, you know, I see people who have no experience online, who just know something online, but are like me, like I'm the caveman on the billboard right now. So, so for this point, I'm like, I'm like, okay, how does the caveman off the billboard do all this in the computer and say, say, I can't do that. It, this might be a good segue about, you know, some of the processes you have in place, but how do we do it? So, yeah. So here, here's what it comes down to. Um, again, this is my belief. Uh, reduce all the friction and all the friction we create ourselves. Your version two of your videos, your version two of the site design, your version two of everything will be better than version one. So don't worry about it. You will eventually have the perfect design. You will have the perfect video. You will not say um so much, but right now, not important. Right now, it's just important to get out there. So you just record. I will give you an example. When I launched my first course, this is, this is how you do it. I jumped on my Facebook feed and I said, hey, launching a course. If you guys are interested, um, join here. I didn't know if anyone was going to be interested. I had no clue. I just had a basic concept. You know, how I broke a million bucks in 90 days online with no prior experience. I did a webinar. I said, this is what's going to be in it. There were 66 people on it. This is what's going to be in it. Um, I'm going to sell it for many thousands, but since it's not created yet, I'll sell it for a thousand bucks. 33 people bought. And I was like, okay, there's an audience for this. I had no product. I had absolutely nothing. <laughs> These people bought. So I'm like, okay, I need to start creating this. So I started to create materials, put it out there. And I used this test group to understand what was really needed. I start going this way. They're not interested. They want this way. So, so I use this audience to figure it out. Boom, done. I create 25% of it enough where I have people we are now making 10, 20, $30,000 a day online. That's enough. There's a lot more things I can do to package it and make it even better, but that's sufficient for right now. So then I go online, I throw out some of it's their like results. Reading the chapter, you know, teaching the course and then never taking the course, but just reading one chapter ahead, like the uh, catch me if you can model. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's just like that. So then I jump online and I host another webinar and I say, 25% um, of the course is done. So instead of paying 10 grand for it, it's only going to be 2,500 bucks. And uh, that weekend we made 800 grand with that course. I opened it up for 48 hours. We had way more people. We shut it down. I, I said only 200 people can join. And we had, I mean, you know, the webinar maxed out at 500. There were people, there's all kinds of little tricks we can do. And I can talk about those another time to create urgency and all this stuff. But, um, but that only happened because I launched with absolutely nothing. So what I'm saying is you don't need to launch with anything. You just need to say what you will eventually do and verify the concept first. Like we will buy your house, put your information here. Boom, beyond that, just do that first. Is that the thing they're looking for? They don't want the house bought. Okay, that's the wrong thing. So don't create a course around that. Don't waste all your time doing that. Next, um, what to do when you're about to foreclose, a 10 step process, then launch that. Did that get the results? Marginal, okay. Um, the three mistakes that people who might foreclose make the week prior to foreclosure. Bam, that one hits. Now you know that that's what they're looking for. Now you created around that. I had a guy come to me and he said, hey, do you do survival stuff? I'm like, I have a site that sells survival stuff. Why? And he told me, I've spent the last five years creating the ultimate survival guy. Like this is, I've got thousands of hours in this. And he's like, and I've got like one person who joined. I'm like, man, mistake. Yeah. You should have spent that thousand hours on pulling them into the door. And once they're in, then give them what they want. And so um, you, everything you need, you can Google. 
my mind is exploding now. Like you have given us so much content, so much context. And for all of our listeners out there, like I was like about a half an hour ago, I was going to tell you to rewind five minutes so you could listen to something. But really, after you listen to this program, you got to listen to it again. Like Trevor has given you about a million dollars plus in information that you would have to go to you know, click funnels, go to Russell Bronson and pay them like thousands of dollars to hear what he just told you. So go back and listen to what Trevor just said on everything you need to do to start getting yourself out there on Facebook. And so it's optimal, right? Because we're, we're just in the process right now of <laughs> ramping up our business. And we've been, at first, it, it's, it's great to have it reconfirmed because we were doing that thing. It's got to be perfect. And when it's perfect, we'll put it out there. But then in the same part, we're like, by the time you take it, it's perfect. It's never perfect. So we just started putting it out there and we'll just figure it out. What's the steps you need? You don't know until you get there. So, okay, great. That's a great affirmation of what we are just doing here. So thank you for uh, telling us that we're not just crazy for putting stuff out there and figuring it out as we go. So, so Trevor, thank you for all the free information, but I want to know how you can directly help our listeners. Like what is it in e-commerce? Because you just gave us so much information, but what is it that you do that can help us directly? Yeah, so e-commerce just happens to be one of the uh, um, methods, but it's all the same stuff. It could be e-commerce, it could be service-based, it could be software as a service, anything. It could be uh, some scientific equation. I'm going I'm to just alter that question one second there for you. Just okay. uh, So, Trevor Chapman goes, these are the businesses that I want to bring to e-commerce. Wh where is the direction or what is the space you like to play in? You like to play in the service side. You like to play on the, uh, the, the education yeah. side. So, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you. So, I'll answer that by saying this. There is a lot of derelict, excellent businessmen out there, a lot of derelict software, a lot of derelict books that would change the universe if there was a marketer behind them. And I'll phrase that now and make it more understandable by saying this. 1400s, 1500s, the people that moved the needle were the people out there on the oceans exploring. 1700s, uh, it's the, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, people saying science, you know, art, music. Uh, 1800s, Industrial Revolution, figuring out better ways to actually produce, mass produce goods. And th this continues. Now today, who is it? people might say, oh, it's the, it's the guys writing the code, but it's, there's so much code. I sit and listen to people pitch me you know, every week on the next code that's going to revolutionize the world. And it is potentially true if their message will reach the world. The, mes the message reaches the world by a marketer delivering it in a manner that they will accept it. So my, what you're saying, what, what, like what can Trevor Chapman be a marketer? That's it. Be a marketer. And after you turn into a marketer, then you can sit back on your real estate empire and you can be an emperor. Once you're a marketer, then you can sit back and you can be a software as a service grandmaster. It all starts though with first being a marketer. And you can, if, if you hate the word marketer, put anything you want there. It doesn't matter. The word doesn't matter. What matters is the discipline. And that discipline is the same discipline that we all have. And that is persuading someone who does not understand or agree currently to understand and agree after the conversation with you. And that conversation does not take place face to face. That conversation takes place online because it's the most effective medium. Think about this. Over the last 150,000 years of you know, human generations, million years prior to that, whatever your belief system is, of everything that we could have created, the culmination of the entire species, the greatest thing we've ever done, is be able to connect real time in different parts of the world instantaneously. Me talking with you guys right now. Mm -hmm. Where are you guys at? New Jersey. New Jersey. I'm, I'm in the middle of Utah. You know, like, and here we are having this conversation. And if it was live, people all over the world would be connected. We have not yet, well, Mainstream wise, we haven't cured cancer. We haven't colonized Mars. We haven't even, we don't even know a fraction of what's underneath the ocean. All these things we could have done. We have not done. What we've done is we've created a platform that allows every human being to connect. There are more connected devices on the planet than access to toilets. 
there are more connected devices in Indonesia than in all of North America combined. It's crazy. So this is the culmination of our human experience. So start using it. Realize that this, this is it. This is what we've done. This is our thing. So now embrace that and be a marketer. Whatever it is, you buy foreclosures, you sell foreclosures. You buy a, you know, multifamily units, you sell multi. It doesn't matter what it is because none of it will work if you're not a marketer. And here's the problem. I'm going to hire a marketer. Marketers make more money than founders and et cetera until all of a sudden they go mainstream. Then you've got you know, Mark Zuckerberg worth billions and all this stuff. But in the beginning, it's the marketers that get the message out there. So if you're going to hire a marketer that's actually going to move the needle, you will likely go bankrupt. Because if they can market, they will market for themselves, um, period. And so the effective marketer is the one that says, you want me to market for you? Um, the only way I'll do that is if you pay me 150 grand a month and blah, 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 blah. That's crazy. But that's because they can do it for themselves. Here's the great, here's the great thing. There is no secret. You can do it for yourself and you can get as good or better than them if you simply decide. It's all it takes. And a whole bunch of failures online, which is fine because you can iterate like this online. And the same amount of time to figure out a right message online, you can do that in a single day. On the doors, that's going to take you 100, 200 doors. How many, I mean, how many weeks will that take to, to kind of hone that message, knocking to someone or even over the phone? My first day online, um, I set up a shop that was selling like artwork and clothing and stuff like that. I realized in 24 hours that this was not going to work. 24 hours because I had enough visitors where I said, okay, they're not buying this. I was not profitable my first day. Day two, I completely pivoted, completely the other direction. Uh, same audience, different direction. Bam, profitable day number two. Day 14, first $10,000 day. I couldn't do that unless I was online, unless I had that data. That's so amazing. be a marketer. That's, so that's, that's the thing. It just in all this, as we begin to wrap up here, taking this for the listeners out there into a real estate phase, you, you some of us, we, we like to sit back. We're so, so worried to put ourselves out there. But if you're listening to Trevor's word, this is the most connected ability you have is to really just put your word out there. And it, with so much noise that you see online right now, it can be lost very easily. Give us one thing that you see that, that can help you stand out just for a person who, who maybe is a little scared to put their content out there then you know, feel worried about being mocked, feel worried about any, uh, uh, just messing up. Give them one piece that they can, they can feel confident about putting something out there that's going to stand out with, within the, all the noise. Okay, I'll give you a connected piece. If you're authentic, it will work. This is the advice I give everybody. Do tailor your message to yourself. So whether it's e-commerce, whether it's service-based, whatever. Let, I'll use the e-commerce example right now, okay? And tailor this to real estate. Find a product that you would buy. Not who you think this mom would buy or that grandfather. What would you buy? Price it at a price point. You would pay for it if you're in a buying mood, the highest price point. And then target yourself online. What did you read? What did you like? What shows did you watch when you were 20? Target the 20-year-old version of yourself. Now, when you were 30, you read, watched, and liked different things. Target the 30-year-old person of yourself. When you're 60, you will read, watch, and like different things. Target the 60-year-old person of yourself. Because if you scratch your own itch, you will undoubtedly scratch others' itches as well. Birds of a feather flock together. And you are not so unique that you utterly and completely don't relate to other humans on the planet. There are millions of people that are like you, and you can access them on Facebook. So scratch your own itch and do it authentically. If you jump out there and you're like, I'm the real estate investor, blah, blah, like no one's gonna listen to that, you know? Um, you're not gonna be Ty Lopez and, and succeed. Like, like that's just simply not going to happen. So authentically deliver your message, target yourself to make it really easy because targeting is a skill set that you have to learn. And if you're trying to target what you think someone else will buy, and you've never walked in their shoes, it's really hard to do that. And then eventually they'll say, oh, this whole internet thing doesn't work. I'm too old, blah, blah, blah. So make it simple. So basically you're just saying walk in your own shoes and figure out what you would do because it's not original and you don't have to be original. Just get out there and put whatever is on your mind out there and sell it. It's just, it's so amazingly simple. I love it. So uh, we have- 
let me just say this one thing if possible, because I know that, that we have to wrap up and everything, but this is really powerful. So I met with uh, Indonesia's largest tech fund manager and one of Indonesia's few US dollar billionaires this last week. And I was presenting at their mastermind and they said to me, there is a three to five year land grab in Indonesia. Uh, he said, in the US, you're living in the future. What you use every day now, we will be using in Indonesia in a few years. So all we do is we watch what you're doing. We do it here. We see what didn't work for you. We don't do that stuff. We do what works here. Now, having said that, it's interesting because I've been saying prior to that, that there's a land grab in the US, which I still feel is the, we're not in a gold rush online. We're in the most formative stages of this continent has just been colonized. If you will simply walk west, you can claim the best land, beachfront Malibu property that you want, and you won't have to wait for 250 years for the value of that property to increase. It will increase the moment you take it if you raise a flag and you say, Malibu. And so right now, online, you have an opportunity in this moment to land grab. The gold rush will be shortly after. The ability to sell the property will be shortly after that. So right now, you need to land grab, and you land grab by just doing. Um, you know, Kim Kardashian, Donald Trump, they were the reality TV era. They made it because of reality TV. Fast forward a little to YouTube. YouTube, Casey Neistat, Lindsey Sterling, all these people who in reality TV would not have made it. The platform was so young that anybody that would just produce content made it. Example, and if, I don't know if you are familiar with YouTube or anything, but uh, the guys that started Maker Studios, he started by dancing around in a unitard or whatever it's called um, on, fate, on YouTube. I mean, I see that as an absolute embarrassment. I would not do that personally. He did it. He was the only guy who was producing daily vlogs, a boring as could be, but people wanted to watch. We have this voyeuristic tendency. He goes and he creates Maker Studios, valued at a billion dollars. He has less talent than you do, I promise. <laughs> Shay Carl is his name. I've sold stuff to him. He jumps on my sites and buy them. I'm like, whoa, Shay Carl just bought because now he's internet famous. He, he lacks talent. He does. <laughs> But he did it. That's the difference. He actually went out and got his message out there. Just bought a ski resort in Idaho. What? How? Because he could not do that in the real business world because he took advantage of the land grab. And there is still a land grab. It is very early. Podcast example. What you guys are doing right now. Perfect example for anybody out there. Create a message. Doesn't matter if it's yours uniquely or not, but if you're authentic and you get just your thousand true fans, done love it absolutely inspired and we have to have you back where we can <laughs> run through a case study because this has been incredible so three quick quick fire questions and we'll let you go and thank yeah. you so much for your time what are some words that you live by um do the work you know it gets really easy not to do it uh especially if you get comfortable it doesn't have to be done you got to do it just do the work um and so that's what I try to teach my kids. Um, and I, I think that that is something that separates, separates it all. And second is you know, celebrating my human experience. Those are the two most important things to me, doing the work and celebrating this unique opportunity I have, this miracle that I'm even here. I mean, this is a miracle, guys. The chances of us being here, the chances that your great relatives weren't eaten by a saber-toothed tiger before they had the next generation is incredible. You are a series of absolute miracles. Good. I love that thought. I am a series of absolute miracles because yeah. it's so true. That's exactly what we all are. If we really yeah. think about it and if we like give notice to that, it just, wow, mind blowing. So another question is how do you give back? So when I had my brick and mortar companies, each year we'd take uh, 150 employees to the third world and, um, and we'd do service projects. So we went to the Dominican Republic, um, school that had 600 students and they were dipping cups in a hole on the school property, dug in the dirt, and when it would rain, water would drip along the dirt road and then filter in there. So they kind of move stuff aside and then they drink and we put a solar powered water filtration and pump device there. Um, and so it was easier with brick and mortar because I had physical employees to take. It's harder now. And so um, I give back, I attempt to give back to contribution-based marketing. 
There's a, an untapped marketing secrets virtual summit happening right now. Um, I presented at that. That's in a few days. I presented at that and gave them all of EcomCon for free. You know, if you buy everything that happened at EcomCon, it's like two grand or whatever. Anyone who participates in that gets that for free. So I, I give back through contribution, you know, as much as I can. That's great. Awesome. So if our listeners are looking to connect with you, what's the best way to find you? Uh, at J Trevor Chapman on most platforms, um, Facebook slash the Trevor Chapman. And just, uh, you know, most messages get to me, um, you know, just post on my wall or something like that. And awesome. And fairly okay. easy. Absolutely inspiring show. I, we started with One Direction and this really, really was just mind blowing. So thank you. <laughs> Seriously, like I, I, we could, this could be our first like two to three hour show. Yeah. yeah I, I could like, sit here <laughs> and, like, listen to you. <laughs> well, yeah, like we said, we'll have to have you back for a follow up session on a, on a, on a fire round show. Maybe uh, for a foundation inspection Friday would be great. Sure. Absolutely. Love to. Thank you again. So grateful for everything that you've given to us, to our listeners today, Trevor. Thank you so much for being on here. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.